you just question when is Lando Norris's elusive win going to come? In a normal era of F1, with the amount of second place, third place finishes he, he's had, even though Lando's never had a car that's the quickest on the grid, and therefore you'd think, well, he should be winning. Lando doesn't get those scraps because Max just doesn't make those mistakes. So it was a brilliant weekend for Lando. It, it will come. Like, it will absolutely come. Hello and welcome to the Fast and the Curious. My name is Christian Hugill and this is our Chinese Grand Prix debrief. I'm um, flying the Fast and Curious ship a little bit solo today. You don't fly a ship, do you? So it's already off to a fantastic start. You, what do you do with a ship? Sail a ship. I'm sailing the ship solo. There we are. Um, because uh, Betty Glover is covering a mix between Champions League football and... And FA Cup football this weekend. We're very proud of her. Go, Betty. Greg James is on a weekend away in Lisbon. I do like Lisbon. I really do like Lisbon. Some lovely food in Lisbon. So Greg's away on a little weekend break, which means we've roped in a friend of the Fast and the Curious, um, one of our favourite reserve drivers for a second appearance. Welcome back to the podcast, F1 TV's Laura Winter. Hello, Laura. What a lovely introduction. I enjoyed the... What did you say? Flying a ship. You're flying a ship. That was it, yes. I think I was... Going for a mixture of flying solo, sailing the ship, and I don't, yeah, not a lot of the things that come out of my uh, brain make sense, Laura. That's fine. I, I, all, all the analogies in one. I, I really appreciated it. But how are you, Christian? You good? Yeah, I'm really well. I'm really well. I uh, thought I was going to be a late night last night, so was worried about the prospect of getting up for the Chinese Grand Prix. Wasn't as late as I thought it was, so it was all fine. But you, you're on a rare weekend off from f1 tv duty so where are you watching from i'm in milan of course oh, <laughs> lovely i haven't really been to milan before um and so kind of took the chance to have a bit of a city break and um sorry housekeeping have just knocked on the door of the <laughs> oh my this is perfect this is lot in your villa in milan go on no let them in let them in we're staying on this is fantastic okay. So such is the authenticity of Laura Winter. Even F1 TV presenters, when they're on their break, are still committed to the F1 cause when you get live action from a villa in Milan. Grazie, grazie. Uh, Mille. Grazie. <laughs> <laughs> Blending in with the locals. Is she coming back later? Yeah, I don't know. I was like, please. No, just please. She was like, water, milk, anything. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, um, that's classic timing. We've literally been in all morning and no one's knocked on the door. Um, no, no, you fit in with the general chaos of the Fast and the Curious perfectly. That is, that is, that is absolutely excellent. Oh, hilarious. Um, right, I tell you what we'll do. We'll go, we'll go through the. Well, hang on, we didn't finish it, did we? We were interrupted by the housekeeper. You're enjoying Milan and we're still able to watch the Grand Prix, I presume. Yeah, so um, had sort of a relatively late night, just enjoying wine and pasta, as you do oh, in Milan. Do, yeah. Um, but then, yes, was up at, well, half eight, because it's actually kind of obviously we're an hour ahead here. Um, yes. So one hour closer to the time of the Grand Prix. Um, so, yeah, half eight, not too bad. Up, 9 a.m. race. I actually quite enjoy, like, a Sunday morning race when I'm sitting at home on the sofa. It's a nice way to start the day. Yeah, I enjoyed getting So I didn't watch the sprint race live on Saturday morning. I watched that on delay but enjoyed yeah. waking up at eight to watch the sprint race, then qualify. And that was a lovely way to start the weekend of a sort of F1 double bill. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, qualifying was great. Like an 8 a.m. qualifying. And the same for the shootout on um, Friday as well. Yeah, it was it's just a nice way to start the day. Um, we, we won't go into loads of detail on the sprint race because it seems like an age ago mm. now. But uh, the first sprint of the season, a fan of a sprint, Laura, I like a sprint race. I, and, I, and it was a really good sprint race to me. It proved why... Why would you not want that? It was good fun. I like a sprint race. I am a fan of a sprint race. I think there is a time and a place for a sprint race. And I think it's interesting yes. to see them um, experimenting with different tracks each season as well. I think the format as it is now, I think, works. Yeah. And I think equally bringing the cars out of Park Ferme now after the sprint race on Saturday morning, afternoon, early afternoon, that means that the sprint race doesn't simply act, as Max Verstappen said, as kind of a replica of the first stint of what to expect for the Grand Prix as well. Yeah. The revisions are really good. Um, it'll be interesting to see how it 
goes and how it looks and shapes up throughout the course of the season at different racetracks as well. But I always think more action on a Friday yeah. in the wet in China for the first time in five years, first time on ground effect cars. Like, it was great. It was some of the best racing of the season in that little scrap between, you know, the Claire Sainz, Alonso. I absolutely agree. Um, and and you're right. We actually explained that on the last podcast, the, the part firm rules where you can make changes to the car again after the, the sprint sort of is done. You, the, Apart from it opens again, you can make changes before qualifying. So that's really nice. I liked F1 being back in China. I, I'd forgotten that I really enjoy that circuit. Overtaking is possible. I love the sort of turn one, two, three, four complex where it's possible to take different racing lines, which is really rare, isn't it, in modern day Formula One, that you can actually find different ways around to be quick, normally there is one racing line in modern Formula One, but I, I really enjoyed being back in China. Yeah, and you heard that actually in the cool down room as well. Just fast forwarding to the to the end of the Grand Prix, Max saying how tight uh, Max, sorry, Lando saying how tight line he was doing through turn three, and Max sort of, uh, you know, seemingly surprised at that just before they cut off the infamous Max Verstappen podcast in the in the cool down room. But <laughs> I've got to say, my heart was in my mouth every time a car came round the final corner. Every, you know, we saw Piastri there, we saw Sainz there, we saw Alonso having a huge moment there. Every single time a car came around, especially in qualifying, I could, I was holding my breath. And Max coming around on that final lap, you know, the D lap in qualifying to take pole was absolutely on the limit. Yeah. The gang that I've spoken to um, out there for F1 TV have all said it's been brilliant and a lot of fun and an incredible atmosphere. So, yeah, I'm actually a bit sad I missed it, to be honest. The fans look great, and I agree with you. That's a great point on the final corner. I'd forgotten how much of a challenge that final corner is. And to go a bit geeky, nice to see a bit of gravel. Yeah. We go to tracks like Austria where people say, oh, well, how do you stop track limits becoming a problem? There's your answer. Gravel, because if you get it wrong, you're punished. It's really not difficult. Gravel. Um, before we move on to the main Grand Prix, let's just recap, um, for anyone who might have missed it, the sprint race podium, which was obviously a uh, Verstappen win, I say, obviously, at this stage. A, a fantastic second for Lewis Hamilton in the sprint race and then third for Sergio. And then to um, recap the... Uh, let's run through the top ten of the race. Why not? A Verstappen from Norris and Perez. Fourth for Leclerc, beating Carlos Sainz, which has been unusual this season. Russell in sixth, Alonso seventh, Piastri eighth, Hamilton recovered tonight and a great point which we'll come to from Hulkenberg in 10th. So on the whole, Laura, how did you enjoy the Chinese Grand Prix? I I enjoyed the race. I really enjoyed it. We had um, a couple of safety cars. We had a few moments, some incidents. The stewards were kept very, very busy. Um, and look, I know we've got the same winner that we've had, uh, you know, for four of the five races so far. Is it four or five? Yes, four or five so far this season. Um, and I know Red Bull have been up there as well, but we had a surprise from McLaren. We had a Fernando Alonso masterclass. Mm. We saw points for Haas. We saw Joe gunning through the field. You know, P14 seemingly like a win for him at the end. Oh, I love that. We'll talk about that in a bit. That was fantastic. So special, wasn't it? Um, so, yeah, enjoyed the race for sure. Mm. I run out of superlatives to talk about what Max Verstappen is doing in Formula One because I think that level of perfection, that relentless search for more and more and more from him is is so i think it we lose sight of how difficult that is to actually yeah when he does lose the odd race or have the moment in qualifying that we saw in in the shootout or you you realize that he is infallible he is human and the level he continues to put out every single race weekend is takes so much from driver from car from team as well the pit stops from Red Bull, they were a 2.0 and a 2.1. That is absolutely outrageous. It is outrageous. And then round two of the pit stops, 2.0 and 1.9. 1.9? Yeah. Absolutely obscene. Honestly, they are operating at a level that, um, you know, it can be seen as boring. But I think we've also got to admire the relentless perfection that we are seeing from Red Bull, from Max Verstappen. And I think Sergio Perez equally being... Um, a very good number two driver at the moment um, within that team as well. Well, why would you get rid of Checo at the moment? A third place today, yes, of course, but, uh, but you know, a, a really good start to the season from Sergio Perez. I'm glad you mentioned the pit stops because they were phenomenal and that's a little example of how good they are performing. And also, um, it, we, we saw examples this weekend of where even the greats can make mistakes. You know, um, we shouldn't underestimate the things that can go wrong. Safety car restarts. 
people make mistakes under a safety car restart, it's tricky to lead a race and lead away from the safety car. Max nailed two of them. Gravel on the final corner, where it's so easy to drop a wheel in the gravel like Fernando did. You don't see that from Max. The pit stops from the whole team, the Red Bull team and Max, they're just operating at 100% perfection all the time. So, yeah, another great race from Max. Yeah. Uh, let's move on from Red Bull and go to second, because as much as I say that Sergio Perez is doing a fantastic job, and he is this season... That sums up why it was particularly good for Lando Norris to sneak into P2. Uh, he obviously made that mistake at the start of the sprint race, Laura, where he probably overambitiously tried to hang it around the outside of Fernando. And he went on to the slippery stuff on the outside and he lost positions. He more than made up for that sort of slight mistake, didn't he? That was a really good Lando Norris drive. The way he operated in the wet in that shootout, firstly, was incredible. He was on pole by a, a large margin. And then when you listen to his race radio after the checkered flag, he was very much saying, I can't believe we held off the Ferraris. I, he bet against himself holding off the Ferraris. <laughs> Such a Lando move, that. <laughs> his engineer was like, I wish I'd taken that bet from you because he too. <laughs> Lando's saying, I don't know how, but that was that was fantastic. Mm. You just question when is Lando Norris's elusive win going to come? Um, he does so much right through a race weekend. He makes the odd mistake here and there. And, it, and I know he's so unbelievably hard on himself as well. There's so much shoulda, woulda, coulda from, from Lando when you talk to him after, whether he's just off pole or whether he's made a mistake like he did in the sprint. or You know, he is incredibly d tough on himself. And that first win is eluding him at the moment. But I think it will come. They are better than expected. And they have upgrades coming in Miami as well. So it'll be interesting to see if they can continue to close that gap uh, and indeed continue to take it to Ferrari the way they did, they did this weekend and close that gap also to Red Bull. Well, people use Lando's lack of a win as a stick to beat him with, but it shouldn't be because he's in an era where, as we've just said, Max is operating at supreme levels. And in a normal era of F1, with the amount of second place, third place finishes he, he's had, even though Lando's never had a car that's the quickest on the grid, and therefore you'd think, well, he should be winning... Take a race like the 2011 Canadian Grand Prix where Jensen Button was running P2 and hunted down Sebastian Vettel. And what happened? Sebastian made a mistake. He outbraked himself. He went wide. Jensen overtook and won the race with a lap, two laps to go. That doesn't happen for Lando because Max is operating even at, I believe, a different level. to And that was Seb at his very best. Even at a different level to what Seb was doing there. Jensen inherited a win through his own pushing, of course, but Lando doesn't get those scraps because Max just doesn't make those mistakes. So it was a brilliant weekend for Lando. It will come. Like, it will absolutely come. There's no doubt about that. I think Oscar Piastri is getting a bit frustrated with himself this season in terms of McLaren's overall pace because, um, before we move on from McLaren, that, that he's not able to squeeze closer to Lando's race pace. I still think Oscar, you know, he's, nobody's doubting he's doing a fantastic job only a season and a tiny bit into his F1 career. But I think Oscar Piastri is going to be looking, obviously, a P8 today, looking at just how he can close that race pace gap to Lando a little bit. That's a big job to do when you're barely out your rookie season and you're up against Lando Norris, but a, a good weekend for McLaren. Outside um, the top drivers, I I want to talk about a moment of the race I didn't expect at the end, where lovely to see a bit of common sense in Formula 1 and a bit of rule breaking in terms of sticking the, the marker thingy on the start finish straight so Joe could finish the race on the start finish straight in front of the fans, the sort of thing that breaking pro F1 isn't a breaking protocol sport. It's a lot of people in clipboards and high vis jackets telling you off for things as we both know, Laura, but um, <laughs> that was just lovely. And that moment where the crowd cheered and Joe got emotional, properly lovely sporting moment. Yeah. It reminded me of his first race in formula one, actually in Bahrain where he scored points on debut. And I saw him coming out of the garage, um, 
about to head into the media pen and just taking this moment. And I, he was in tears then, you know, he was overwhelmed, overcome with emotion. And then he's had to wait since then to race on home soil. You know, the other drivers seemingly get their, their home races. They're stuck in the calendar. The Chinese Grand Prix has obviously had to come back from the break during COVID and then another cancellation and postponement. And then now in 2024, almost said 2023, in 2024, the Chinese Grand Prix is back, back with a bang a sellout, so much Sauber kit in the crowd as well. Mm. For so many to be there with the show, and there's that wonderful photo of him as a kid in the crowd. And then it's sort of been put next to him on his knees, you know, crouched down, head in his hands at the end of the race, absolutely o- overcome with emotion. And yeah, look, it was P14 today and he'd have wanted, obviously more, he'd have wanted to be pushing up for points and, and Bottas was a DNF, obviously, to bring out that first safety car. So... It could have been a much better day for Salva, but I think for Joe, he was absolutely overwhelmed with emotion. I think it was a very special weekend for him. Um, and yeah, just a really lovely moment to see. I think F1 is is big business, isn't it? But there is space for part in there, and, and that was a lot of that. Yeah, I'm so glad they did it. Um, and, and we should say, for anyone who missed it, you know, I do say this a lot. People take for granted that F1 drivers are always F1 fans. They're not always. Yeah. So it makes it all the more special when you're a kid wearing your merch, you know, when you're a F1 geek like me and you, you're mm-hmm. there racing. It's it's really special. Uh, and, and, yeah, before we move on from Sauber, really tricky starts to the season. I did want to give one guy a shout-out. Normally we give him a shout-out for entertaining us. I was actually, before this weekend, in my notes prepping, looking at, some of Valtteri's times thinking I was harsh on Valtteri Bottas last year. I didn't think he had a brilliant year at Alfa Romeo last year and thought, I don't know what you're supposed to be the one dragging this car up. Yeah. Don't forget the Sauber team's about to turn into Audi who've got huge ambition. So it's not a guarantee that either Valtteri or Joe will keep their seat for next season, which is the final season of Sauber before we get the Audi takeover in 26. Yeah. I think Valtteri's reminding people, well, he's doing his best to audition for one of those seats. It's, uh, he obviously got um, unlucky in the race today, an engine failure. But I've been more impressed with that. I've been more impressed with Valtteri Bottas's pace this year than last, Laura. I don't know if you've spotted because Valtteri said actually, I don't think people are giving me credit, and I, I tend to agree with him. Yeah, uh, Valtteri Bottas is, Bottas is reminding us all of, of exactly who he is, um, who he was, and we're seeing a bit of that bite, that grunt from the sort of Mercedes era of Valtteri Bottas. Well, also, and you saw it in Australia, being able to be himself, yeah. really embracing who he is and who he's become. Um, and it seems that he's loving life. And now a lot of that's transcending into how he's driving the car as well. So yeah, I'm hoping to see more pace from the Saubers. Um, and once they've got these pit stop issues underway, under underway, hopefully not underway, um, once they've got them sold... Under control, yeah, yeah. Then, yes, uh, we may be able to see them knocking on the door of the top 10. Because that battle for points with the, the, the lower region teams is fascinating. Nico Hulkenberg is doing a bloody brilliant job this season. And he's one of those drivers being linked with a Sauber slash Audi seat. And he's really putting himself in the shop window because again, 10th place today. I've spoken a few times on the podcast this season about how impressed I am with him as Kevin Magnussen seems to be creeping into making more mistakes, struggling for pace, possibly I think signaling the end of his Formula One career might be upon us. Nico Hulkenberg's doing a fantastic job and he's he's right in the mix for an Audi um, seat there. That'll be, and that's why, again, Joe needs to, you know, keep pushing forward because that is that is a really interesting battle for seats. A um, couple of bits of any other business. Interesting weekend for the two Ferraris, Laura. I thought Charles Leclerc will be much happier with his pace overall. He seemed far closer to Carlos and, and then, you know, beating Carlos really for the first time this season. Yeah, definitely. I think we've seen some real frustration from Charles Leclerc in recent races, mostly around qualifying, where we are so used to seeing him challenging for pole positions. You know, he's one of the fastest men over one lap, without doubt. Um, That's not been the case so far this season. He's had his issues in qualifying. Whether that's because actually Ferrari are also setting up the car far more in race spec than one lap pace, that might in it, but obviously Carlos is managing to extract a bit more, or certainly has been. Mm. I, don't, I don't think it's necessarily a case, therefore, of Charles is really underperforming. I think Carlos is showing us exactly what he's about in a contract year where he's just lost his seat. But yeah, Charles needs to push on up as well. Ferrari, though, they'll be looking to try and get get ahead once again of the McLarens, I would say, in um, in Miami next time out. 
And then, you know, they're doing a great job, both Ferrari drivers, I think. What a, what a strong driver line at Ferrari have got. You, you wouldn't want to interrupt that, would you? You wouldn't want to break those two up. Excellent driver pairing for Ferrari. Anyway, <laughs> let's move on to someone else who has had trouble this year, uh, but had a better weekend, Daniel Ricciardo, who has been saying that he wanted a chassis change finally got his chassis change and this weekend or again Danny Rick got very unlucky by being absolutely poleaxed by Lance Stroll and I'm sorry Lance come on everybody else managed to stop and not just make a bit of contact that was like you know when you lose control of a shopping trolley when you're putting it back and you hit the metal barrier at the front of the thing and you make a real noise and everyone looks and you're like, sorry. Uh, it was really one of those. Yeah. It was like not just a tab. Lance, come on, like, like wake up, my friend. But, yeah, so he unfortunately got his diffuser broken into 18,000 pieces and retired from the race. But that was better from Daniel Ricciardo because let's be honest, he was quicker than Yuki all weekend, yeah. which he needs to be if he's going to keep that seat, if he's going to look for other seats. Do you think that, I mean, I don't, I'm guessing you don't know because I certainly don't know about the chassis. Was that something to do with it? I guess none of us really know, do we? Whether it is literally a placebo effect in a sense. I wonder. I don't know whether it's simply Daniel Ricciardo wanted that new chassis, he got it and he felt suddenly he had a bit more confidence. You know, I can't possibly say I'm not sitting in the cockpit. Of... Well, none of us can. We're all ge we're all guessing on this, aren't we? Like we don't know. But generally, I think he needed that confidence boost to know that he can beat his teammate because at one point the gap in qualifying was 0.4 seconds, which was the same gap in qualifying as Nick de Vries at the start of last season to Yuki Tsunoda. So Daniel knew he had to step up for sure. I thought during the end of your answer there might have been an ice cream van, but I think it was a siren. In fact, yeah. wasn't it? Was it? Was it you or was it me? No, it was me. There was um, it wasn't an ice cream van, or else I'd have just lo left this entire. Yeah, oh, me too. Jumped out. The yeah, here and been gone. Forget the podcast. No, it was an emergency vehicle, so I will not be doing that. I'll be staying inside. <laughs> no, fine. Okay. Well, we hope all is well there. Oh uh, yes. Um, Laura, should we do some listener questions? Yes, we shall. Um, we've mentioned the safety car, of course, um, for this race. And we had a couple of those out there. We had some VSCs, we had some uh, the virtual safety car, and then we had two safety cars. Um, a bit of chaos at one of the safety car restarts as well, which tees up very nicely some safety car-related listener questions that have come in during the race from Mia. So hello, Mia. Thanks for your questions. She has asked... Who drives the safety car and is it always the same person? Yes. Now, Laura, I know you'll know the answer to this as well as me. Um, it is a man called Bert Mylander, who is a German race car driver. Because let's not, you know, that safety car looks like it's sort of pottering around a, a village in comparison to the Formula One cars. It's not. I've been driven. You've been in it, haven't you? Yeah, I've been driven in the, in the wet in, oh my gosh, I think it was Canada. Oh, it's awful that I can't remember, but I think it was... <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, but yes, can I'm gonna say it was Canada and it was the 70th anniversary of the safety car. So I was given um, an amazing experience in the safety car, driven by Burn around, and they do not mess about. And bear in mind it's wet as well. So I was like, oh, we'll probably just go a bit steady. And then I was like, what? You know, it was sort of raced off down the straight and the braking zones are so intense as well. Burns a former racing driver. There is no messing about here. None of us could step into that safety car and do what is required for the safety car to do. Yeah. Um, it's yeah, it's an incredible thing. And also, I got the whole, the full um, format and system that happens when there is yellow flags, a virtual safety car, and then a safety car. So I, I had the whole thing, and I was on the radio back to FIA doing the entire the entire system, which was really exciting. It was really cool to see how it works internally. So yes, I've been in it. They do not mess about. And, and Bert is a German driver. Uh, he has been driving Formula One's various iterations of safety car for coming up to 25 years now. And, and as Laura says, a fantastic racing driver in his own right. We'll look, we'll go into that a bit more. I'm going to try and get myself in a safety car. I think, I think we need to do a bit more of that. Yeah, that, so yes, um, uh, it was Mia's question. It is Bert. It is always the same person. It has been for a number of decades. Um, and yeah, you said multiple safety car questions. As we had multiple safety cars, why not? We'd, yeah, the second one actually relates to something that we saw in the race today as well. And that is, why did Logan get a 10-second penalty under safety car? I wish there was a way this could have been dealt with differently, but it's hard all round. 
um, there is a line, you'll notice it um, when you're watching on the TV coverage, there is a line on the pit exit that crosses through the the horizontal line where the drivers aren't allowed to pass. They're not allowed to go over that line on the pit exit. There's a, a there's another line going across the circuit, which is called the safety car line. Now, Nico Hulkenberg pitted under the safety car. Logan Sargent was coming round to overtake him. And because Nico was coming out the pits and hit that safety car line before Logan did, it should have been Hulkenberg's position on track. However, Logan got there just behind him. Logan swept round and overtook him and should have given him the place back. But we are talking centimetres. And for the drivers, it's a physical impossibility to see that with the front wing. You're not seeing that. For the team to have been watching that, there's a lot going on. That's too harsh to turn around and say, you should have seen that. So it was a fair penalty. It's just a really bloody harsh penalty yeah. because there's not a lot Logan could have done. Not a lot Williams could have done without some superhuman responses, which means... Um, it wasn't investigated until the race got back going again, I think I'm right in saying. Lord. Yeah, a flurry of penalties came in um, all at the same time as, as we were into that final stint after the safety car restart. I, there's no yeah. way that Logan could have seen from his position within the car. Um, yeah, it, it's ultimately down, therefore, to the team being able to communicate to Logan. But it, as you say, um, you know, with, with everything that was going on, it's, it's difficult, isn't it? But it's... Yeah, ultimately, it's on the team. It is on the team. Uh, who are we not sitting on a pit wall? It, it, with so much going on, with the, it, God, it's really tricky. Uh, and even they're watching on monitors by the naked eye. You know, you've got a split second to judge that. You could not see by the naked eye. Would have been nice if there was a, a you 2 swap round. Yeah. I think by the time it had been spotted, the race had got going again. Therefore, it was too late. If that had been spotted under the safety car... You have seen positions where because you need to give that place back and it would have been like, all oh, right, fair enough. That would have been the ideal situation, but it was spotted too late and therefore it was a penalty. Just really unlucky on what had actually been. I still think Logan's got a lot to do to claw it back, but it had actually been his best race of the season. He was right up there with Alex, which is where he needs to be. That That car is not quick enough to score points at the moment, but... Logan to keep his seat needs to be right on Alex's backside and and actually that's as close as he's been all season so hopefully Logan will be able to take that going into his home Grand Prix we're hoping to speak to Logan very soon on the Fast and the Curious that is TBC because he's a very busy man but we're hoping to grab a word with him at his home Grand Prix um awesome. Laura it's been an utter pleasure chatting through the race with you an utter pleasure can we just do a bit of total fast and curious nonsense with you before we let you go back to your weekend away? Please, yes. Pizza is calling me, but I couldn't possibly head out for pizza until I hear some nonsense. So let's do it. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we have we have our lovely fast and curious studio. We also do these episodes from home where I've got some soundproofing behind me, and an incredibly um, eagle-eyed listener spotted on uh, on YouTube. You can watch these episodes on YouTube now if you're not aware. Search fast and the curious on YouTube. There is a tiny. I don't know if you could see it, Laura here. There is a tiny little Formula One driver given to me by my friend Chris in my soundproofing. Just there. Can you see it? Yeah, a little white, it's a white speck from where I'm sitting here. And somebody spotted that. No. And did the whole, like, zoom in? Well, we've purposely not bought the dinky driver to the camera to, to make what is Formula One's hardest quiz, guess the dinky driver. Now, so far, our guesses have included Zhou Guan Yu, which is not... George Russell, it is not. Uh, and the late, great one, Manuel Fangio, it is not. Oof, okay. So we're asking our listeners once a week to guess. Now, bear in mind, that's that's pretty much it in terms of clues. Oh, I think we also gave away that they are a European driver. But that is all we know. Not Joe, not Russell, European, not Fangio. On the grid or any time, any era? Well, that, that is yet to be established. Right. And found, found at an antique shop. <laughs> oh, normally, Laura, normally we would give, pe we give our listeners one question and one guess. I'm going to be really harsh here. Because you're a professional, Laura, I don't think you get a question. I think that's... I, I think, you know, you've, you've got right. a skin in the game here, being a professional F1 presenter. But I will invite you to guess the dinky driver. Laura, who do you think the dinky driver is? I am going to say... I've got two in mind. 
I'm going to say Kimi Raikkonen. Kimi Raikkonen. It's a good guess. Good guess. Laura, I can exclusively reveal. Come on. It's not Kimi Raikkonen, I'm afraid. I'm really sorry, Laura. I'm really sorry. I hope you're going to be able to concentrate on your holiday not knowing the identity, whether it's going to sit in the back of your mind. I'll drown my sorrows in Aperol spritz. I'll be all right. Okay. <laughs> You'll just cope. <laughs> You'll just survive. So competitive. So I really thought I was clever then and got it right. No. Kimmy was a great guest because he was around for 20 years. So it, it, antique shot, great yeah. thinking, very solid, logical thinking. Finland's in Europe, of course. So yeah, you know, it, all very logical thinking. So yeah, it fit. Okay. Laura, apologies for that. Sorry to end on a sour note, but it has been brilliant having you back on the podcast. And we appreciate you squeezing us in when you're in literally on your holiday. It, it's It's in Milan. It's delightful of you my pleasure thank you so much for having me um great to be on hope to see you soon i will see you in miami amazing that's great yeah i can't wait for miami it's gonna be hot it's a sprint weekend another sprint um yeah i'm very excited to be back in the paddock it's good for miami so um i'll be on the ground in miami um in my f1 capacity but i'll be obviously keeping fast and curious listeners up to date with the latest, so we'll look forward to that. Before then, we'll be back in the Fast and the Curious studio, me and Betty, for some fun midweek. If you've got any questions about everything you've just seen in this weekend's action from the Chinese Grand Prix, you can get in touch on social media. We are Fast Curious Pod. Uh, on TikTok and Instagram is the best way to do that. You can, of course, follow us on our new YouTube channel. Just search for the Fast and the Curious, and you can pop your questions in the comments there. We'll be back midweek. Laura Winter, it's been an utter pleasure. For the love of God, go and eat some pasta. And I will see you later in the week on the Fast and the Curious. Thanks, Laura. Thank you. Bye. Bye.